Hi everyone, Zach here, and welcome to the prep video for Lesson 17 in this series on developing a survival game. This prep video and this series have been brought to you by Patreon sponsors. That said, let's make a start. In this tutorial, we'll be setting up our item structure, and in particular, we'll be setting up our child and subchild classes to do so. We'll be focusing mostly on our food, and therefore we'll be creating two test food items. There will be one from our herb class and one from our meat class. Don't worry, we haven't created those classes yet. That's part of today's lesson. And we'll also set up an event for when we do eat food. Now this event will not be fully functional, and it won't be fully functional until we complete our menu, but we're setting it up so we can very easily tackle the eat event. To do this, we need to explore abstraction. And we've already talked about abstraction. We've talked about it with regards to function and data abstraction, but there's multiple types. So some types are function, data, as we're already aware, and class-based abstraction. Now we're gonna review function data real quick and then focus on class-based abstraction. So function and data are things we've already discussed, as I've said a couple of times now, and we've already used it. With regards to functions, we have things like check has stamina. With data-based abstraction, we have our B is discarded in our inventory master, which is a private data type, which is an abstracted data type, now we haven't fully set this up and I'll bring this up again later in this video. We will fully set this up when we do our menus for this section. Now we'll continue to use abstraction throughout this section and this series. Now I get that abstraction is hard for a lot of people. I kind of talked about why that is, but we need to think about this perhaps in a larger context to understand it more fully. And thinking about it in this larger context will make class-based abstraction easier to understand. So let's talk about that idea of class-based abstraction in a larger context. I want you to think of a car. What car are you thinking of? Are you thinking of a 1992 Grand Prix? No, you're not thinking of that Pontiac? Well, I was. I mean, it was the first car I ever drove when I was 15 and I got my learner's permit. Okay, well, were you at least thinking of some mode of transportation with four wheels, seats, doors, seat belts, a windshield, steering wheel, and perhaps an engine of some sort, even if it's electric versus gas or petrol? You were. Okay, good. That's abstraction. We have a basic concept of what a car is. And for people with some background in psychology, think schema. We have some order of classification that we group things in. It doesn't matter that a 92 Grand Prix is different than a Ford Mustang, is different than an Aston Martin. They all have things in common. They have wheels, they have engines, their modes of transportation, what have you. That is abstraction. We have an idea of categorization, and from that we can have different things with under it. So the Grand Prix, the Aston Martin, um, what have you. But the car, the idea of a car, is an abstraction. It is a classification system. So, we engage in abstraction normally as humans. We do so when we classify video game types. We have first-person shooter, survival, RTS, roleplay, um, puzzle games, what have you. We do it when we think about movies. We have horror, comedy, action, um, adventure, romantic movies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And while sometimes there's overlaps, like romantic comedies, survival RPGs, first person RPGs, action RPGs, et cetera, et cetera, there are base elements from those other classes, classes in quotes here and base in quotes as well, literally in this case for the word base, that are being used to fill in our understanding and our expectations. Now, sometimes these things can be a bit Nuance, you know, think about what makes something a horror movie or a terror movie or a suspense movie. Suspense and terror are slightly interchangeable. However, they are separate from horror. And at some point, I'll actually be doing a video essay 
on this and how the tropes that define these in literature and in movies actually don't work in video games and how in video games they're a bit different or they modify them to fit the standard trope. But that, that will be in something else. Now, all of that said, why do these highbrow concepts matter? Well, good abstraction makes game design easier and it, as I've said in the previous prep video, minimizes the need to repeat code. Also why I gave you that challenge a couple of videos back. Think about this for a moment. Take a classic arcade game like Asteroids. What do the ship, the asteroid, the flying saucer, and the bullet all share in common? There are two main things. They all move, so they all have a position on the screen in the X and Y grid, being a 2D game, X and Y, and they all have sprites. We could create a movement abstract class that allows for the drawing of the object on the screen. And we can create a sprite abstract class that has the sprites stored. And then we can call them in our ship, asteroid, saucer, bullet, what have you. In fact, our characters have a movement component. All NPCs would have a movement component, assuming they're humanoid NPCs. That's abstraction of movement prevents us from having to rewrite stuff. Also, you know, when it comes to, as I mentioned in a previous video, input devices, we don't need to tell the system how a controller works. It has an abstraction for getting controller information. So how does that relate to what we're doing? Well, we're going to create some abstract classes. Now that said, in the video itself, while the classes are technically abstract classes, I do not set the classes to abstract. In Unreal, you are able to define a class as abstract. The children of those classes tend not to be abstract. I mean, you can set them to be, and you would for what we're doing. And it prevents you from setting them in the map. In fact, actually, you'll see in the video that I try to pull one of the uh, master files onto the map, and I do that by accident. And that's just simply because I haven't set it to abstract. I will do that by the end of the section, I'm not entirely sure why I didn't do it in the video itself, but hey, it, it's one of those things. So even though we are creating abstraction today and doing, doing class abstraction, we aren't setting the classes themselves to be recognized as abstract classes. Not that we need to. It just is a nice tool to have in place. So I want you to think about the questions I have on the screen, and after I read them, pause your video and think about the answer to this, or these. What do all items share in common? What do some items share in common and the others don't? And how can we group them? All right, go ahead and pause the video and think about this just for a moment. Okay, now that you've thought about that, let's explore the answer to these. What do all items share in common? Well, this one should be relatively easy as we've already addressed it earlier in this section. We addressed it by creating a abstract structure where we have our item name, our description, our item weight, if it's consumable or not, where we have an icon. That is our item master. That is the abstraction for all items. What do some items share in common that others don't? Well, I briefly touched on this a few prep videos back. Let's take a closer look at this though. Some items will be equipable, some won't be. So we can create a abstract class for our equipable items. Some items will affect character stats like health, hunger, stamina, potentially. Some will grow in the world. And as a reminder from what I said a few videos back, sometimes you'll get these sort of class structures wrong. You'll get the hierarchy of, you know, the child parent classes just slightly incorrect. And that's fine. Mistakes happen. Don't worry. You can always fix this by reparenting, by creating a new parent and reparenting to those. There are multiple options. And I, I gave an example of three a few videos back. And how can we group our items? How can we group the classes for them? Well, there are a few ways. And the way in which you decide might not match what I'm doing. But if you're following along with the tutorial, let's explore what we'll do in this series. 
So in this series, we will have a primary item master that has our structure. It's an abstract structure. Underneath that, we'll have three classes that will be our first layer children and also be masters for other children. We'll have an equipment master. We'll have a resource master and a utility master. As for our subclasses, under our equipment master, we're gonna have a weapons master. Our resource master will have a construction master and a food master. Our utility master, as of right now, that might change down the road, will have no children. It will, well, it will have children, but they'll be the items themselves. By the way, for this flowchart, as we move forward, I'm only going to do the abstract classes you can imagine under these, there will be the children that are the items themselves. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And finally, under our food master for today's video, we're gonna create a herb or herb master. Sorry, the joys of an American living in the UK. I will switch between herb and herb and a meat master. Now, this is the final structure we'll have today. Under our herb master, we'll have an item, a test item. Under our meat master, we'll have a test item and Let's be thinking about it this way. Under our equipment master, we'll have armor items that can be equipped. Under our weapon master, we'll have weapon and mining items that can be equipped. Under our construction master, we'll have construction related items. Under the herb or meat masters, we'll have food items. Under our utility master, we'll have utility based items. Let's talk about this a little bit more in depth in terms of why the structure is happening the way it's happening. How are they grouping? Our equipment master will store the functionality for equipping items, as some items will be equipable, and this includes weapons. We will override our on-consumed event from item master. Now I say override, the on-consumed event is actually just a blank event in our item master that all items share in common. How they're implemented will be different. So the on-consumed is what will allow us to equip our items. Now, it will check between regular weapons and check between, uh, sorry, regular equipment and regular and weapons to see where it needs to be slotted into on the character. And unfortunately, the difference between our regular equipment and weapons is actually great enough to require a, a weapon structure with the way I'm doing this or a weapons class. And also the on consumed in these checks will allow for things like say, you can't turn your flashlight on unless you have a flashlight equipped. Now, as a challenge, based on the fact that we're going to have two different classes for equipment types, weapon versus other equipment, after we complete section three, and yes, section three, come back and see if there's a different way to implement this. That said, of course, we will be setting our equipment mostly up in section three, because section three will focus on equipment. As for a utility master, well, our utility master will store functions for other items like ammo, batteries, information stroke, data shards, or whatever you want to call them. And these will be consumable in their own way. So we're not gonna focus too much on this, mostly because I haven't implemented this in the test file yet, so I don't have much to say on them. As for our resource master, that's where we'll be spending the bulk of this section. Our resource matter master will store functionality for all directly consumed resources, except for ammo or flashlight batteries. So things in particular that affect our character stats, be they primary stats or secondary stats. And secondary stats will be things like coldness. And we'll talk about that in sections four and five of this series. We will have settings to change the item amount spawned into the world. So when we spawn an item in, we have sort of three options. So four, if you split procedural into two. We have foliage, so that's our foliage painter. We have procedural generation, which we'll have two different methods of, and we can place things by hand. For foliage and procedural generation, what we'll do is, based on the random scale that it's assigned, it will change how much the item has to add. So item amount is that amount we can pick up, or that is pick up that the item is containing that you can pick up. And you know, if a tree is a scale of two and it has the same amount of wood as a, scale, a tree of scale one, it kind of ruins immersion. So what we'll do is create functionality in this video where we take the scale volume, so we multiply all aspects of the scale together to determine our overall item amount. And this again will vary based on the item scale. 
course, with hand placed ones, we can override this and decide what we want it to be ourselves. And we'll have settings that affect how the item is discarded because when we discard an item, the scale actually is gonna be reverted to one. And also, say so have a lot of fun with this down the road, you know, when you discard an item, the item respawns in the world. Well, if the item is wood and wood comes from a tree, the original mesh for wood is a tree. You don't want to be walking around planting trees. In fact, actually, we will do that as a joke. Um, and also to show you how to get around that, that bug. So we'll have all of these in our resource master. Implementation of these and other nuances will occur within the subclasses. So first we have the construction master. In the construction master, it will store the functionality for items used in construction. So for example, wood. And primarily, this will be used for building shelters via the trees. Um, I say wood is auto-collected. Technically, it isn't. You actually will trigger the collection event, but when the item is spawned into the world, it is auto-collected. It's a bit... It's kind of both auto-collected and uh, manually harvested. But we'll talk about that more when we get to Section 5. In Section 4... Sorry, Section 6. In Section 4... Four, when we do this, um, it will be purely manual harvesting. There will be secondary functions built in for other supports, so secondary supports, so building fires, building um, traps, if we include traps and what have you. And we will mostly set this up in section four, the construction master. The utility of the items we're picking up will do in section six. Now, our food master, which is where we'll spend most of this tutorial, will store functionality for all food-based items. Herbs, or herbs again, sorry for the American living in the UK here, will be able to be spawned into the world and will always be harvestable. So it's not auto-collection. We'll have to press a button for this. However, meat items will be found via hunting and will be auto-collected. So if you ever played No Man's Sky and you're using a little mining laser on a tree and you have those blocks flying towards you and you suddenly pick up the resources, that's what's going to happen with meat. Except we're, we're probably not going to have the meat fly at you because that'd be horrifying to see and probably not fit with the immersion of the game world. So when you kill an animal, it will drop its meat, which sounds so very weird, I realize, and you're able to walk up to it and just auto-collect the meat, assuming there's space in your inventory. Now, both of these will affect the character hunger. So the Food Master will have, in particular, things around character hunger. Meat and herbs will have the various parts for being collected versus auto-collection. All of that said, that covers kind of what we need to know for today's video. So I hope you've enjoyed this prep video. And if you have, or if you just enjoyed this series, please hit that like button down below. And if you want to make sure you're here when the rest of the series comes out, hit that subscribe and notify bell. If you don't hit the notify bell, YouTube might not decide to tell you about the new video until way later. This series, as I mentioned at the start, have been brought to you by Patreon sponsors. Sponsors like Quad Menson, Rian, and Haynes. That said, I look forward to seeing you in the main tutorial, and I hope that you have a wonderful day.